Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand, and the sheep of His hand. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand and the sheep of his hand. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we have this opportunity to come into the house and to worship thee, dear Father, and we pray that our songs and our worship will be acceptable to thee, that the lesson that we hear tonight will sink deep into our hearts, dear Father, and to enrich us and we can become stronger servants stronger believers and have ever increasing faith in you dear father we pray that the lessons that are taught here will cause us to want to leave the building go to our neighborhoods and be disciples dear father like you expect us to be to find those people that are out there dear father that do not know you that we can find them teach them encourage them tell them about christ pray dear father that they can become christians dear father continues to guide our footsteps that we can walk the narrow and straight way have a home with thee in heaven dear father father uh, we pray again tonight for the many people that we know our families members here our neighbors that have illnesses pray dear father that you can be with those doctors and nurses and help these these people to recover their health dear father for we miss them very much dear father continue to help us to be strong never to fail steady become stronger each day dear father and may we go quickly and find those that need to learn about thee and teach them in jesus name we do pray amen Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream. Flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river near the cross a trembling soul love and mercy found me there the bright and morning stars shed its beams around me in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my rapture 
tortured soul shall find rest beyond the river near the cross O Lamb of God bring it scenes before me help me walk from day to day with its shadows on me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river i am a sheep and the lord is my shepherd watching over my soul my soul to keep guarding over me ever watching wherever i go and when the winds blow he is my shelter, and when I'm lost and alone, he rescues me. And when the lion comes, he is my victory, constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. We are his children, and he is our father watching over our soul great is his love for his sons and his daughters watching wherever we go and when the winds blow And when the lion comes, he is my victory, constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. And when the winds blow, he is my shelter. And when I'm lost and alone, he rescues me. And when the lion comes, he is my victory, constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. Good evening. Welcome back to Beltline. Great to see you all here tonight. Always a pleasure to see your smiling faces. It looks like a spring break is upon us, as many are, are not back tonight. But we'll have quality over quantity tonight. And uh, don't tell them I told you that. So uh, glad that you're here as we continue a series of lessons that we've been looking at for the last three weeks now, handling five of the bi biggest objections that you're going to hear uh, to faith. Uh, as you start to talk to people about Jesus Christ, as you step out boldly with your faith, as you arise and build, as we've been talking about on Sunday morning, you're going to meet some resistance. You're going to meet some different uh, uh, objections, and uh, that's what we're trying to deal with on Sunday nights. We've talked about the problem of evil. We've talked about why there is a hell. Uh, last time, we talked about how being good enough is not really the standard by which we're going to be judged. And tonight, I want to talk about a fourth thing that you're going to hear as you step out in your faith. Uh, this one has to do with the Bible itself. You see, most skeptics are going to repeat an accusation that the Bible is full of errors and the Bible is full of contradictions. And if you've talked with people who are not followers of Jesus, you've probably heard this objection at one time or another. And these supposed errors and contradictions, according to these skeptics, are what makes the Bible unreliable and not to be taken seriously today. The Bible, therefore, in their opinions, cannot be the Word of God, as Christians claim, and this throws uncertainty on the very existence of God in the first place. You ever hear anything like this? My guess is you have. You've probably encountered people who've had this objection at one time or another. Now, what's interesting to me is that when you ask someone to give you an example of those supposed errors, if you ask someone to give you an example of those supposed contradictions, 
most don't really have a lot to say. I don't know if you've ever engaged in a conversation, but this is often a smokescreen. And if anyone would take the time to honestly evaluate these supposed errors and these supposed contradictions, they would see the truth. You say, what's the truth? The truth is this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God. There's the truth. And if people would take the time to examine the evidence and look at these supposed contradictions and errors, I think they would come to the same conclusion. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, complete for every good work. But sadly, not everyone believes what 2 Timothy 3 lays down for us. And so the question for us tonight is how do I help someone who has a subjection? How do I handle myself when this comes up? Let me start by saying this. If this is a topic that you want to study more deeply, I want to recommend a resource for you. Because there is no way in our 30 minutes tonight, uh, even if we went an hour and a half like we did this morning, we'd be able to cover this topic. It's too vast, it's too broad, it's too big. And so I want to recommend a resource for you. It's a book by a guy named John W. Haley, H-A-L-E-Y. If this topic interests you, I want you to write this down. He has a book that came out several years ago now entitled Alleged Discrepancies of the Bible. And he really does a very comprehensive job at looking at alleged discrepancies that have come under attack from Scripture. And he looks at doctrinal things, he looks at ethical things, and he looks at historical things. Now, admittedly, I haven't read the entire book, but what I have read of it, I really, really like. And so if this is something you're interested in diving into a little bit more, John Haley, Alleged Discrepancies of the Bible. So, let's talk, though, about what we can do when we encounter somebody who has this objection. How do I help? There's four things that I want to suggest that you do if you're contacting or conversating with someone who has this objection. Here's the first thing, and we said this already, but let me say it again. I want you to ask them to be specific. So when someone says you can't trust the Bible, it's full of errors, it's full of contradictions, what I need you to do is say, give me an example of one. I'm interested in this. I want to know what this uh, example of uh, an error or a discrepancy are. Because the reality is, Bible scholars for generations have heard every single accusation out there, and they've all been answered. The problem is, most people don't take the time to actually investigate the answers. They'd rather just believe the Bible is full of errors and contradictions, because then they don't have to follow it. It's a smokescreen, so ask them to be specific. And as you do, if they are able to come up with one, That leads us into the second thing that we need to do, and that's this. Don't feel like you have to answer on the spot. Now, would it be great if we had a ready defense for every possible objection that's been thrown at us? Sure, that would be fantastic. But you don't have to answer off the top of your head because when we do that, sometimes we make things worse, right? I can guarantee you every supposed contradiction that somebody brings up has already been answered. And so what you need to do is don't feel like you have to answer on the spot, but instead, number three, go do your research. You know, for all the problems and all the headaches and all the heartaches that the Internet has, man, this is a place where we can really get some great tools and some great resources to help us. Article after article after article, book after book after book has been published on these very topics that someone might bring up. And so you have a a plethora, if I may say so. Ooh, huh? You think I have a plethora, right? That's uh, Three Amigos, one of my favorite movies of all times. I could recite the entire monologue for you. I'm not going to do that. Uh, So do your research. There is a ton of research out there uh, about these things. And number four, finally pray. You see, just doing the research isn't enough. Pray. Pray for God to give you the right words to say that's going to help those uh, objectors get beyond skepticism and at least take a small step toward faith. Because if a person reads the Bible, here's the truth. 
If a person reads the Bible without being on a mission to find contradictions, what they're going to find is the Bible is understandable, the Bible is consistent, and the Bible is in harmony. Now, admittedly, and let's make this very, very clear tonight, there are some passages of Scripture that are difficult to explain. And yes, there are some passages of Scripture that seem to contradict other passages of Scriptures at first glance. But why is this? Why does it appear there's contradictions? Well, let me just say it this way. The Bible is, is compiled of 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years. The Bible covers many different topics. The literature in the Bible is in different forms like poetry and, and history and teaching and prophecy. Each writer of the book of the Bible wrote their books to a different audience and from a different perspective and for a different purpose. And as a result of that, we should expect some differences. I mean, if it wasn't, we would think there was some kind of uh, conspiracy here, uh, and it wasn't really uh, the, the great, amazing document that it is that God breathed out. But I want you to know, even though there are some differences, a difference is not the same thing as a contradiction. Okay? A difference is not the same thing as a contradiction. It's only a contradiction if there is conclusively no possible answer for how the verses or passages can be in agreement whatsoever. And let me say this as well. Even though, even if the answer has not yet been discovered, that does not mean that an answer doesn't exist. Many skeptics and critics of the Bible have promoted a supposed contradiction in the Bible, especially in relation to history or geography or archaeology, only to be proven wrong once further evidence is discovered. I'll talk more about that in just a second. But here's how I want to tackle the remaining of our time together tonight. I want to look at 11 reasons why skeptics think the Bible is full of errors. And I know 11 is too many. I know by the end of this, your head's going to be reeling because mine is putting it all together. But I cut as many as I could that I didn't think were ultimately uh, the most important things to share with you tonight. And the best I could do was 11. I can think of 16, really, but we're going to talk about 11 tonight. So I've trimmed it down, and we're going to hustle through these things <coughs> Excuse me, but I hope that we can have a, a better understanding of why certain skeptics believe the Bible is full of errors and accusations and all kinds of things at the end of this. So here's number one. Eleven reasons skeptics think the Bible is an error. Number one, assuming that the unexplained is unexplainable. This is the first reason why some people think the Bible is full of errors. They think the unexplained is unexplainable. But when a scientist comes upon an anomaly in nature, does he or she give up further scientific exploration? <laughs> no, they don't do that, do they? No, it, it makes them want to study more. It makes them want to dive in more. And, and this is the problem with skeptics when it comes to the Bible. They say, oh, there's a contradiction. I'm done. I'm walking away. When no other place in the world do we do that except when it comes to Scripture. Why? Because it's a smokescreen for me not wanting to put myself under subjection to the Word of God. It should lead us to deeper study, but instead it doesn't always do that. And not only that, you know, scientists once could not explain meteors. They couldn't explain eclipses. They couldn't explain tornadoes or hurricanes. You know what? Until recently, scientists didn't even know how to bumblebee could fly. All of these mysteries have yielded their secrets to relentless persistence and patience. And so scientists do not know how life can grow on thermal vents in the depths of the sea. But no scientist throws in the towel and cries, contradiction, right? So why do we do that with Scripture? The true biblical scholar answer, uh, true biblical scholar approaches the Bible with the same presumption that there are answers to the unexplained. You know, at one point, critics once proposed that Moses could not have written the first five books of the Bible. Here's what they said. Moses was part, uh, uh, was a pre-literate culture. And so Moses couldn't have write it, contradiction, throw the whole thing out, it's not God's word. But yet, Science and archaeology has uncovered that there was uh, language and, and, and all of that in existence thousands of years before Moses ever came on the scene. 
And so archaeological finds continue to prove the trustworthiness of Scripture. Critics also once believed that the Bible's references to the Hittite people that we read all about in the Old Testament, they said they're totally fictional. There's no such thing. There's never been any history. There's never been any archaeological finds that these people existed. The Bible's a bunch of junk. Throw the whole thing out. Now the Hittite library has been found in Turkey. And so all of these things that, that people want to cry foul on, at some point or another, are explained, have been explained, or will be explained. And so don't assume that the unexplained is unexplainable. It is. Sometimes it just takes a little bit longer for archaeology or something else to prove the trustworthiness uh, of Scripture. A second reason why uh, skeptics believe the Bible is full of errors is that they confuse our fallible interpretations with God's infallible revelation. Interpretation versus revelation. This is a big one. Jesus affirms in Scripture, in John chapter 10, that Scripture cannot be broken. And so, as an infallible book, the Bible is also irrevocable. Jesus says, truly I say to you, heaven and earth won't, will pass away. Uh, before that happens, man, not one stroke of the law will pass away until it's all accomplished. And so to Jesus, Scripture was final authority. It was the last word in everything that it discusses. Jesus employs Scripture to resist the temptations of the devil. He employs Scripture to settle doctrinal disputes and to vindicate his authority. And sometimes a biblical teaching rests on a small historical detail, a word, a phrase, or the difference between the singular or the plural. And the point is this. While the Bible is infallible, human interpretations are not. We're going to mess that up. If you have a Bible that has uh, somebody giving you their commentary at the Bible, that's, that's not inspired. That's someone's opinion. What is inspired, what is infallible, is what God has given to us in his word. One, you, me, we should not be hasty in assuming that a currently dominant assumption in science is the final word uh, of something. Some of yesterday's irrefutable laws are considered errors today by scientists. And so contradictions between popular opinions and science and widely accepted interpretations of the Bible are going to be expected and should be expected. But this falls far short of proving that there is a contradiction in Scripture. A third reason why skeptics think the Bible is an error is a failure to understand the context. This, to me, as I looked at so many different of these supposed contradictions over the last several weeks, this is the biggest one. It's like we have thrown common sense out the door. We've thrown common sense out the window and said, I'm just going to make it say whatever I want it to say to say there's a contradiction. There's this thing called context, and it's important. And so the most common mistake of all Bible interpreters, including a lot of critical scholars, is to read a text outside of its proper context. As the old adage goes, a text out of context is a pretext. And that's right. One can prove anything from the Bible by this mistaken procedure of not appreciating or thinking about context. Did you know that the Bible actually says there is no God? Psalm 14.1. If I take that out of context, the Bible says there's no God. But if we look at the context, it says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Right? And so the majority of contradictions fall under this time frame right here. Others will say, you know what? Look at this contradiction. Jesus says, don't resist the evil one. And so someone says, Jesus admonished us not to resist evil, but in the context in which he cast this statement, we cannot ignore what was happening. And so many people read Jesus' statement to say, give to him who asks, like I'm just supposed to give a gun to a kid. I'm just supposed to give it to them and let them do with it whatever they will. No, look at the context. We have an obligation to look at the context. And failure to note the meaning is determined by context is a chief sin of those who find fault with the Bible. Man, I could go on for days talking about these. Let me leave that right there. Number four, a fourth reason why skeptics think the Bible is an error is forgetting the Bible's human characteristics. 
Yes, the Bible has a lot of human characteristics because with the exception of a small section such as the Ten Commandments, which were literally written by the finger of God, the Bible was not verbally dictated. It wasn't, okay, Peter, I want you to write, thus saith the Lord, right? That's not how it was interpreted, right? It's not how it worked. The writers were not secretaries of the Holy Spirit. They were human composers employing their own literary styles and their own idiosyncrasies to Scripture. These human authors sometimes used human sources and things that were relevant to them of that day for their material. In fact, every book of the Bible is the composition of a human writer, again, about 40 of them in all. The Bible also manifests different human literary styles. Writers speak from an observer's standpoint when they write of the sun rising or the sun setting. They also reveal human thought patterns, including memory lapses and human emotions. The Bible discloses specific human interests. Hosea has a rural, 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 rural interest. Luke has a medical concern. James has a love of nature, right? And all of these things factor in to how they write. And so forgetting the humanity of Scripture can lead to falsely questioning its integrity by expecting a level of expression higher than that which is customary to a human document. And this is going to become more obvious as we discuss uh, some further mistakes of the critics. Let's look at number five. A fifth problem is assuming that a partial report is a false report. This is a reason why skeptics think the Bible is in error. Assuming a partial report is a false report. Critics often jump to the conclusion that if it's not exactly the same in every single reference, that it's got to be false. But that's not so. If it were, then most of what has been said would be false, since seldom does time and space permit an absolutely complete report. So, for example, take Peter's famous confession in the Gospels, right? We see it in Matthew 16. What does he say in Matthew 16? They say, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, right? The son of the living God. Well, in Mark, he's not the Christ, the son of the living God. He's just the Christ. You are the Christ. And then in Luke, it's the Christ of God. Is there a contradiction here? <laughs> no. There's just different, different people writing different things, getting what they needed to get across the cross. Even the Ten Commandments, which were written by the finger of God himself, are stated with variations the second time that they are recorded. Look at the difference between Deuteronomy 9 and Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. You'll see there's a lot of difference when it comes to that. There are many differences between the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles in their discrepancies or descriptions, excuse me, of identical events. There's differences, yet they harbor no contradiction in the events they narrate. Was it one angel or three that came to the tomb? Or was it two? (laughs) Maybe one's just reporting about the one that spoke and the other one saw all three. It doesn't mean that they're in conflict. It doesn't mean they're in error. It just means we're getting a partial report, not the whole thing. You don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. That doesn't make any sense. Number six. Assuming divergent accounts are false. Here's what I mean by that. Because two or more accounts of the same event differ does not mean they are mutually exclusive. Let me use the example I just gave you. Matthew 28, 5 says there was one angel at the tomb after the resurrection, whereas John informs us there were two in chapter 20, verse 12. But these are not contradictory reports. An infallible mathematical rule easily explains this problem away, doesn't it? Where there are two, isn't there always one? Right? If I have two, then I always also have one. (laughs) This is simple, but this is the kind of thing that you find with people who are saying the Bible is full of errors. There may also have been one angel at the tomb at one point on this confusing morning and two at another. One has to add the word only to Matthew's account to make it contradict John. It doesn't say there was only one. It just says there was one. But if the critic comes to the text to show that they err, then the error is not in the Bible. The error is with the critic, right? 
Likewise, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 5, we're informed that Judas hanged himself. But Luke tells us in his, uh, uh, God, his book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 18, that Judas burst open in the middle and his intestines gushed out. Oh, contradiction! Is it? Is that a contradiction? So did Judas die by hanging or by his guts gushing out? Sorry for the visual there. If Judas hanged himself from a tree over the edge of a cliff or gully in the rocky area and his body fell on sharp rocks below, then his entrails would gush out, just like Luke vividly describes. It's not a contradiction. We're just getting two perspectives on the exact same thing, right? And so assuming divergent accounts are false is going to lead people to think that they're are errors in Scripture, and there's not. Number seven, presuming that the Bible approves of all it records. This is another one of the big ones. Just because the Bible records something doesn't mean that God approves of it, right? And so this is important. It is a mistake to assume that everything contained in the Bible is commended by the Bible. The whole Bible is true, but it also records some lies. Did you know that? It records the lies of Satan. It records Rahab's lie. Uh, it records uh, Abraham's lie. Over and over and over and over, we see this. Inspiration encompasses the Bible fully in the sense that it records accurately and truthfully even the lies and errors of sinful people. The Bible does not hide the faults of its heroes. That's one of the reasons we can trust it. That's one of the reasons we can believe that it's actually the inspired word of God. The truth of Scripture is found in what the Bible reveals, not in everything it records. You have a guy in the New Testament, I didn't write this down, just popped in my head. You have a guy in the New Testament that says, we know God doesn't hear the prayers of sinners. That's not inspired. That's just what the guy said, right? It's his understanding of truth. It doesn't mean it was actually the truth. Are you following me? And so just because he said it doesn't mean that that's what God wanted everyone to believe. But unless the distinction is held, it's going to be incorrectly concluded that the Bible teaches immorality because it narrates David's sin, or it promotes polygamy because of Solomon's uh, many, 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 many wives, or that it affirms atheism because it quotes the fool as saying there is no God. Uh, these aren't contradictions. They're just things that people don't like that they throw out there to try to make their smoke screen a little darker. Uh, number eight. Neglecting to note literary devices. We mentioned this earlier. Let me get a little more specific here. Human language is not limited to one mode of expression, right? There's, there's body language. There's, there's all kinds of different ways. And so there is no reason to suppose that only one literary genre was used in this divinely inspired book. The Bible reveals a number of literary devices. Whole books are written as poetry. The synoptic gospels feature parables. In Galatians 4, Paul uses allegory. The New Testament abounds with metaphors and similes and hyperbole and even poetic figures. Jesus employs satire. Figures of speech are common throughout the Bible. And so if he is being uh, uh, using a hyperbole or using a simile and you take it to be something else, that's not a fault of the Bible. That's your fault. That's my fault for not seeing the, 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 the breadth of what God is doing. It's not a mistake for a biblical writer to use a figure of speech, but it is a mistake for a reader to take a figure of speech literally. And so obviously when the Bible speaks of the believer resting under the shadow of God's wings, it does not mean that God is a feathered bird, right? But yet these are some of the accusations that get thrown against the Bible. Oh, it's full of errors. It's full of contradiction. Is he a God or is he a bird? Really? That's what you have to work with? That's what you're, you're throwing at me right now? When the Bible says God awakes as though he were sleeping, it means that God was roused to action, not that he was literally sleeping up in heaven and needed to be woken up. These are figures of speech. The Bible used them all the time. So if you neglect to understand that and note that, you're going to think the Bible's full of errors, but it's not. Number nine, forgetting this is so important. Forgetting that only the original text is inerrant. Stay with me. 
Genuine mistakes have been found in copies of Bible texts made hundreds of years after the originals. There's no doubt about that. God only uttered the original text of Scripture, not the copies. Therefore, only the original text is without error. Inspiration does not guarantee that every copy is without error, especially in copies made from copies made from copies made from copies. For example, the King James Version on 2 Kings 8.26 gives the age of King Ahaziah as 22, whereas 2 Chronicles 22 verse 2 says he was 42. The later number cannot possibly be correct, or he would have been older than his father. (laughs) So this is obviously a copyist error, but it does not alter the inerrancy of the original. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And so there are errors in the copies. Yes, there's no doubt about that. But there are no errors in the original. Second, there are, these are only minor errors, often in names or numbers, and none of them affect any of the teaching of Scripture. Third, these copyist errors are so few in number that it's not even funny considering a book that's been around as long as the Bible has. And fourth, usually by the context or by another Scripture, we can know what is actually an error. For example, Ahaziah must have been 22. And finally, though there is a copyist error, the entire message still comes through. For example, if you received a letter with the following statement, would you assume that you could collect some money? Let me throw that on the screen. Let's say it's legit and somebody sent you this. Oh, have won $20 million. And then you said, I'm not sure it's right, and so I'm not going to go get my 20. And then you get another one the next week that says that. You're going to go get your 20 million? Of course you are. The minor mistake that was made doesn't change the message, does it? Not at all. Even though there's a mistake in the first word, the entire message comes through, and you're $20 million richer. <laughs> And if you received another letter the next day or later after you didn't respond, you'd be even more sure when that part of the error was fixed. This is why scribal mistakes in the biblical manuscripts do not affect the basic message of Scripture. Do you understand that when scribes went to interpreting Scripture, that this was such a gigantic deal? Scribes were some of the most well-respected people in the entire world at that time. And these scribes would literally spend their days copying from an original a, a copy of that original. And, and, and every time they came to the word Lord, they would have to put their pen down and go wash their hands. And then they would come back. And if they messed up at all, they would throw the entire thing out and start over. This is why, because people understood the value of the word of God. They did everything in their power to make sure there were no errors. But even then, you can read, we, we do this a lot with the bulletins. You know, we have like six people proofread that thing. Guess what? Every now and again, an error still pops through. What are we going to do with that office staff? I don't know. They're just contradicting themselves. They're just full of errors, right? It's crazy to think that way. But that's, that's the kind of thing that people are throwing up uh, against the Bible in today's world and calling it an error, calling it a contradiction. It's not. It's not. Remember, it's only the... Uh, the original, not the copies that is inerrant. And let me get to number 10 and 11, we'll be done. Number 10, confusing general with universal statements. This is another reason why skeptics think the Bible is full of errors. Like other literature, the Bible often uses generalizations. For example, the book of Proverbs has many of these generalization statements. Proverbial sayings by their very nature offer general guidance, not universal assurance. They are rules for life, but the rules that admit of exceptions. So Proverbs 16, 7 says that when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. This obviously was not intended to be a universal truth. Paul was pleasing to the Lord, and his enemies stoned him. So don't confuse generalities with universal statements. Jesus was pleasing the Lord, and they crucified him. 
It is a general truth that one who acts in a way pleasing to God can minimize his enemy's antagonization. That's the point. Not that every single time this is a hard and fast universal rule, train up a child in a way that he's going when he's old, he'll never depart from it. I'm sorry, that's not a universal truth. That is a general path that happens. And some of you know that very, very, very well. Proverbs are wisdom, not law. And when the Bible declares, you shall be holy for I am holy, then... Then there are no exceptions. Holiness, goodness, love, truth, and justice are rooted in the very nature of, uh, of an unchanging God. But wisdom literature applies God's universal truth to life's changing circumstances. And the results will not always be the same. But they are helpful guidelines for us to live our lives by, right? Finally, number 11. And this may be uh, another one of these big ones. And that is oftentimes people forget that later revelation supersedes earlier revelation, right? Later revelations supersede earlier ones. Sometimes critics do not recognize what I'll call progressive revelation. You see, God doesn't reveal everything at once. It's not how he works. Nor does he lay down the same conditions for every single period of history. Some of his later revelations are going to supersede his earlier statements. And so Bible critics sometimes confuse a change in revelation with a mistake. That's not, that's not what it is. That a parent allows a very small child to eat with his fingers, but demands an older child use a fork and spoon, is not a contradiction. It's not a contradiction. It's progressive revelation with each command suited to the circumstance. And so there was a time when God tested the human race by forbidding them to eat a specific tree in the Garden of Eden. But that command is no longer in effect, is it? Why? Because later revelation does not contradict the former. Also, there was a period when God commanded that animals be sacrificed for people's sin. However, since Christ offered the perfect sacrifice for sin, this Old Testament command is no longer in effect. Read the book of Hebrews to talk all about that, right? There is no contradiction between the later and the former commands. Now, of course, God cannot change commands that have to do with his unchangeable nature. That would be a real-life example of a contradiction or an error. Since God is love, he cannot command us to hate him. That would be a contradiction. Nor can he command what is logically impossible. For example, to both offer and not offer a sacrifice for sin at the same times and in the same sense. It just doesn't work that way, right? But these moral and logical limits notwithstanding, God ha can and God has given non-contradictory progressive revelations which, if taken out of its proper context, can look contradictory. It's a much a mistake to assume a parent is self-contradictory for allowing a 16-year-old up to stay 16-year-old to stay up later than a 6-year-old. It's not a contradiction for a 16-year-old to stay up later than a 6-year-old. It's just progressive revelation. The older you get, the later you can stay up. It's the way it works. All right? I was the youngest, I got whatever my oldest brother got. It's cool. And if we want to kind of conclude all of this, and I know it was a lot, and I know it was somewhat scholarly, and I hope that something can stick with you in this. The Bible cannot err, but critics can, and critics have. There is no error in God's revelation, but there are errors in our understanding of it, and there have been errors in copies. And so when approaching Bible difficulties, I think the wisdom of St. Augustine is vexed. Here's what he says. If we are perplexed by any apparent contradiction in Scripture, it is not allowable to say the author of this book is mistaken. But either, number one, the manuscript is faulty, the translation is wrong, or you haven't understood. And I think St. Augustine nailed it. There was, a, again, a lot of information in that lesson. We've only scratched the surface on this topic. But I want to remind you again, we have answers. 
We have answers to every possible contradiction and error that someone could throw at you. There has been Bible scholars who have worked on these and, and have done amazing work to give us the resources that we need to have the answers to the contradictions and errors that people throw out there. And so do not be scared off by someone claiming an error or a contradiction. Ask them to be specific. Do your research. Pray and watch God work in the lives of you and the person you're working with. Most of the time, when someone says uh, the Bible's full of errors and contradictions, I just don't believe it, most of the time they're not going to have any specific. They're just repeating what they've heard. And when they do actually come up with one, it will be an answer that is easily explainable. So be confident. God's word is living. It is active. And it is powerful. And it can change any heart in any situation if that person will allow it. And so trust it. Trust the scripture and don't get crazy when people throw up smoke screens like this. You can do it and I hope that you will trust your knowledge of the word of God and that you will uh, not give up when objections arise. We're going we're gonna to finish uh, our fifth objection in a few weeks and I, I look forward to uh, walking with you through the last one. It's one you've heard before. Well, why do I got to why do I got to go to church? Why do I why do I got to do it your way? Don't all roads lead to heaven? You ever heard that one before? I mean, it's the same God, it's the same stuff. All roads lead to heaven. So why don't we just that's what we're going to tackle finally as we look at the fifth objection here. I'm not going to be with you next week. Uh, I think our teens are leading the service next Sunday night. It's going to be a fantastic time. I hope that you'll come and support them and be a part of that. I'm so grateful for you being here tonight. If you need uh, prayers, if there is uh, anything that we can help you with, if you need to give your life to Jesus Christ, I pray tonight uh, that you will make that decision while we stand and sing this song for your encouragement. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me and cast me not away from your presence O oh lord and take not your holy spirit from me restore unto me the joy of my salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Amen, church. You may be seated. At this time, if you need to take the Lord's Supper, if you weren't here this morning, you can be dismissed to room 206, and it'll be there waiting for you to be partake. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of Mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry.